Genesis chapter 29. Genesis 29, and we're going to pick up in verse 31. I'm going to read, which uh, I think A.W. Pink said is some of the most boring passage in the entire scripture. I'm sorry, that's where we're at. We take it all. And so we find ourselves Genesis chapter 29, verse 31, and I'm going to read uh, chapter 30. It's a bit long, but uh, that's where we're at. Genesis 29, verse 31, the text continues, When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, Because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. She conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. Again, she conceived and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband will be attached to me, because I've borne him three sons. Therefore, his name was called Levi. And once again, she conceived and bore a son and said, This time I've praised the Lord. I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah. Then she ceased bearing. And when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. She said to Jacob, Give me children or I die. And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, Am I in the place of God, who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? And then she said, Here's my servant Bilhah. Go into her, so that she may give birth on my behalf, that even as I have children through that I have children through her. So it says in verse four, she gave her him her her servant Bilhah as a wife, and Jacob went into her. And Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God has judged me. And has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore she called his name Dan. Rachel's servant Bilhah conceived again and bore a second son. And Rachel said, with mighty wrestlings I have wrestled with my sister and have prevailed. She called his name Naphtali. And when Leah saw that she had ceased bearing children, she took her servant Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Then Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a son. And Leah said, good fortune has come. So she called his name Gad. Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. And Leah said, Happy am I, for women have called me happy. So she called his name Asher. In the days of wheat harvest, Reuben went and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, Please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, It is a small matter that you have taken away my husband. Is it? Would you take also my son's mandrakes? And Rachel said, Then he may lie with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. And when Jacob came from the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, You must come in to me, for I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he lay with her that night, and God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. And Leah said, God has given me my wages, because I gave my servant to my husband. So she called his name Issachar. And Leah conceived again, and she bore Jacob a sixth son. Then Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will honor me because I've borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. Afterwards, she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. Then God remembered Rachel and God listened to her and opened her womb. She conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she has called his name Joseph, saying, may the Lord add to me another son. And as soon as Rachel had born Joseph, Jacob, Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, send me away that I might go to my own home and country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you that I may go. For you know the service that I have given you. But Laban said to him, if I found favor in your sight, I've learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Name your wages and I'll give it. Jacob said to him, you yourself know that I have served you. And how your livestock has fared with me. For you had little before I came, and it has increased abundantly, and the Lord has blessed you wherever I turned. But now when when shall I provide for my own household also? And he said, verse 31, What shall I give you? Jacob said. Jacob said, You shall not give me anything. If you give if you will do this for me, I will again pasture your flock and keep it. Let me pass through all the flock today, removing from it every speckled and spotted sheep and every black lamb and spotted and speckled among the goats, and they shall be my wages. 
so my honesty will serve, sir, answer me for, for me later. Excuse me. So my honesty will answer for me later. When you come to look into my wages with you, every one that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the lambs, if found with me, shall be counted stolen. Laban said, Good. Let it be as you've said. But that day Laban removed all the goats that were striped and spotted and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that is white on it, and every lamb that was black, and put them in charge of his sons. And he set a distance of three-day journey between himself and Jacob. And Jacob pastured the rest of Laban's flock. Then Jacob took fresh sticks of poplar and almond and plane trees and peeled white streaks in them, exposing the white of the sticks. He set the sticks that he had peeled in front of the flocks in the troughs, that is, the watering places, where the flocks came to drink. And since they bred when they came to drink, the flocks bred in front of the sticks, and so the flocks brought forth stripes speckled and spotted. And Jacob separated the lambs and set the faces of the flocks towards the striped and all the black in the flocks of Laban. He put his own droves apart and did not put them with Laban's flock. Whenever the stronger of the flock were breeding, Jacob would lay the sticks in the troughs before the eyes of the flocks that they might breed among the sticks. But for the feebler of the flock, he would not lay them there. So the feebler would be Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. Thus the man increased greatly and had large flocks, female servants and male servants, camels and donkeys. Let's pray. Lord, as we consider this passage, I would be the first to admit at first appearance, it looks like one of the most boring passages in all the Bible. And in fact, it's been commented as such. But Lord, I also know that there's two factors, that your Holy Spirit has put things hidden within the text that are easily revealed, and that you have an agenda to speak to the hearts of these men and women. And because of that, I lay myself open, naked, and bare before these people, asking that you would speak that you would take this text that seems so dead and boring and make it come alive. And that can only be done by the person of your Holy Spirit. That can only have life if you breathe within it. So, Lord, I humbly ask that you would give grace to this, that you would take your glory, and that, God, if you can ever show yourself to be strong, it would be here tonight in this passage. So I need your grace. We ask that you would be glorified and that you would give wisdom to us, mere men and women, Please cleanse us by your blood. Please wash us. Put your angels around us. And I pray, God, that your nature would be revealed here in this place. God, heal our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for the past several times we've been meeting together in the book of Genesis, we've been seeing that Jacob is the man that, for lack of a better word, he's a weasel. Everything that he does is trying to work an angle in order to get what God would certainly would have freely given him anyway. The very earliest remembrance that we have of him is weaseling out his brother Esau, not only of the birthright, but of the blessing, stealing away from a man something that God had already told him that he was going to give him. So all the way back in Genesis in chapter 25, it's declared that the older shall serve the younger, that God had declared, God had said that Jacob is going to have the place of superiority. But even though Jacob could hear these words that came from God, that his parents knew them, what we found is that they didn't believe God. And therefore, they walked by sight and not by faith. They walked by what they could reason and not by what God had given by his revelation. And as a consequence, we saw in our previous study that when it came time that Isaac was blind, and we saw that he wasn't just blind physically, indeed he was, but he was blind spiritually. He, having lost the sense of who God was, began to make decisions based upon his sensual appetites. He was one who favored Esau, the older son, above Jacob, the younger son, who God said was to be the blessed child. But Isaac, dimming in sight in his old age, favors Esau for the simple reason that Esau made food that appealed to his sensual appetite. And what that tells me is that a man of God that starts well, that can be contemplative and meditative like Isaac was, can soon enough drift away like any man upon the earth if he begins to slowly nurture the things of his flesh. Flesh in and of itself is not evil, but he defied what God had said because of the appetites of his flesh. And so God had said, the older shall serve the younger. He says, no, the older will rule over the younger because I like his game. You imagine that? I like your game, buddy, so I'm going to let you be the man. And this is essentially what was going on. We find now that Esau 
is going out, sent by his father, in order to get some game, to hunt it down, to bring it to him. My son, go get some venison and cook it the way that I like it so I can bless you before I die. The only thing he's concerned about in his old age is his, his sensual appetites, the desires of his flesh. A man who at his young age only desired about the things of the Lord was in the field meditating upon God, spending time with the Lord. Now here in this old age of blindness, all he cares about is the sensual appetite. And that's why Paul, as we found that he says in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, the great danger that I think we face is that, to borrow the words of a different passage, having begun in the spirit, we're trying to be made perfected in the flesh. Paul said in Corinthians 9, 27, that I don't want to be disqualified. And these things can make me no longer a usable vehicle of God's service upon the earth. Giving in to the sensual appetites, murmuring. He talks about all that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. But the greatest fear is to become like Isaac, essentially, a man who was once used by God but is now not being used at all. But Jacob, the younger brother, he in his mind was saying, wait a second here. My dad's making decisions to bless the older above me. I need to get clever. He already stole away the birthright from him in a previous chapter, but now here in chapter 27, he decides he's going to get clever and he's going to help God out. I wonder sometimes if he got that notion from his great, his grandfather, Abraham. Abraham tried to help God out at one point in time when he decided to get Keturah to help God out, give him a son. That produced Ishmael and Ishmael is the work of our flesh and it's been a fabulous blessing to the people of God ever since. It's from Ishmael that the Muslim nations came forth. So anytime we see that man is trying to use his own flesh and his own prowess and renounce to do what God has told him to do, he finds that he defiles it. So the man of God begins to be the one, we believe, that accepts what God says by faith. That is, I don't see it, but I trust you, not because I feel it, but because you said it. And if you said it, that's good enough for me, I'm going to act according. But if Jacob was walking by faith, not by sight, When he saw by sight, my father's going to bless Esau in my place, and God told me that I was to be the one blessed, if he was walking by faith, he would have said, God will work it out. I can take the passive role. If God tells me to do an active thing, I'll do that. But if in in the lack of him telling me to do anything actively, I'm going to step back and let God take control. But because he wasn't walking by faith, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, that here you have Isaac blind, you have Jacob blind, And he decides that he, too, is going to work according to his own resources. Of course, Jacob takes more of a a personality characteristic from his mother. And his mother, of course, is the sister of this famous man, Laban. Laban was a weasel of a man. And every time we say Laban, we don't say Laban. We say Laban (laughs) because he was that bad. And what God was going to begin to do is to teach Jacob a lesson through Laban. So what late Jacob does to his father is he comes in who can't see. His father can't see, no sight. And he deceives him by putting on garments of goat's hair. That tells you how hairy Esau truly was. He put garments of goat hair. Jacob was touched by his father. And he says, is that really you, Esau? And he says, it sure is. He goes, the voice is like Esau. But the voice is like Jacob, but the hair and the, the smell is like Esau. And so he blessed him. And so in one way or another, he was using deception to bring about God's purpose and plan. He was using deception. We have a notion, I think uh, I've talked of this many a time, is that we think that the means justifies the end. What that means is it doesn't matter that I'm doing something bad as long as it brings about the ultimate good. That's the way we we justify sin. You know what God says? No. God says, I hold the end. So the means are the only thing that I'm concerned about. We who don't walk by faith say, I got to help God out. The means justifies the end. I got to do bad things, lie, cheat, and steal to make sure that good things happen. And God would come in and say, no, I hold the end. I'm a sovereign God. And therefore, what you do in the process is what I'm concerned. Will you trust me even when it appears that things are going against you? Are we concerned with, are we trying to be concerned with the end and make it happen? That's because we're trying to, play the part as God. But are we concerned only about the process, the in-between, the process of being his servant? That is the only reason because we believe ourselves only to be servants. So the man that thinks himself to be God is the one who tries to manipulate and to cheat and becomes unholy. The man who thinks himself to be the servant sees himself as being the tool in God's hands and therefore he becomes holy. Strange, isn't it? 
So here he comes. He says, well, the means justifies the end, so I'm going to lie, cheat, and steal. I'm going to pretend I'm someone that I'm not. I'm going to put on garments. I'm going to deceive my father in order to get the blessing so I can bring about the very thing that I know that God is going to give me. And what happened? As opposed to receiving the blessing, well, he did receive the blessing, but as opposed to having unity and blessedness within his family, his family blew up. And in fact, you can see families sometimes will blow up overnight. Everything's calm, everything's right, but underpinning it, there's a decay. There's something rotting away the foundations, and nobody wants to address it. It's dealing with a situation where there's some very bad things going on in the family, and the whole approach to it is, well, we're not going to address it. We're just going to pretend it didn't happen. Okay. But if you don't address the foundation issues, it leads to dry rot at the, wor- at the very least, and suddenly the building will collapse in a moment. You say, how did that ever happen? Because he didn't address the real issues. And here in a moment, Jacob is seeing his family blow apart, but he was trying to preserve it. He was going to be the blessing, the one who received the blessing, the one who's going to carry on the family, and now his family flies apart. His brother is going to kill him. His mother, who was trying to preserve him and keep him close, was the one who strangely offers the suggestion to send him away so he doesn't die. The very thing she was trying to do was preserve him, and she's the one by her own voice. She ends up sending him out and putting him under judgment. Amazing. And now... He's away from his mother. His father feels deceived, therefore not respected. His brother wants to kill him, literally, and he finds himself in a foreign land. As he's running away, God meets him in the middle of the night. It was there at a rock. He set his pillow for a rock, as you heard me say, is that a clear conscience makes for a soft pillow. Well, Jacob's pillow was a rock, which tells you he didn't have very clear conscience at all. And so as he's sleeping there in the middle of the night, God, by his grace, approaches Jacob. God doesn't have to come to man. Matter of fact, do you realize that God doesn't have to convict you? Sometimes we think that this isn't God's grace. When God convicts you, that's God's appearing to you. No man can get into your heart. No man can speak truth into the innermost being. But when God's spirit convicts you, that's God's grace. And if he didn't do that, that would mean that you're no child of his. And so the fact of his appearing to man is to confront man with the reality of who he is. And it can bring assurance. It can bring rebuke. But nonetheless, this is a picture of God's grace. Here's Jacob. He's running where? He's running from the promised land. He's leaving the land that God told him to be in. And what was the promised land? It was always a picture of the spirit-filled life. In Christendom, we always think of Canaan as being a type of going to heaven when you die. We're going to cross the old Jordan when we die, and we're going to go into heaven, you know, Canaan. It's not what it means. Canaan, go back to our previous studies. We established this. Canaan is always a picture of the spirit-filled life. What was Abraham tempted to do when he faced trials and difficulties to run back to Egypt, run back to the world, to escape out of Canaan, to run away from the spirit-filled life? And in fact, he did for a short little blip of life, but God rebuked him and he came back. What was Jake, Isaac tempted to do when famine came into the land? He went as close as he could get to going into the land, into Egypt. He put his tippy toes on the border and kind of arched his bodies over the top of it and says, I'm going to get as close as I can to going into the world without getting into the world. I'm going to dwell within Gerar. And there's Christians like that. Technically, they're still walking in the spirit, but they're actually trying to get as close as they can to the world. It'll eventually lead you to be spiritually blind and you'll be deceived. And you'll make improper judgments based upon sensual appetites. And you'll find yourself opposing the very word of God that he has revealed to you. So Isaac becomes this one that almost went into the land. And here comes Jacob. But you see, Abraham, when he went out to get a son for his a wife for his son, he says, don't let Isaac leave the land. Stay in the land. Stay in the place of the spirit. I'll go out and get a bride and bring her to you. But Isaac now, in his old age, in his lackluster spiritual life, says, okay, Isaac, Jacob, excuse me, you leave this land of the spirit. You leave the land of Canaan. And the very thing he was trying to preserve was the thing that ruined him. So the very fact that he is walking in deception, deceiving his father, uh, deceiving his brother, manipulating, uh, being, uh, uh, tr- using trickery with his mother in order to get what he wanted, by nature, if you're going to live like that, you have to leave Canaan. You have to leave the spirit-filled life. 
If you're going to live like that, it's opposed to the Spirit of God, and you will find yourself living. So don't grieve the Spirit of God, Paul says in Ephesians 4.30, by which you've been sealed with anger, malice, contention, strife, sexual immorality, etc. In other words, the works of the flesh grieve the Spirit of God, and by nature, you have to leave Canaan because it's like oil and water. They don't mix. So Jacob ends up running away. And he ends up fleeing to the very place that God had strictly told them, never leave. This is the land. So God appears to him and says, Jacob, I'm going to bring you back to this land. I imagine God probably saw into his heart and says, he's going to leave. He's going to leave whether I tell him not to or not. Jacob, I'm going to bring you back. And if he wanted to bring him back, it's because he didn't want him to leave. I'm going to bring you back to this place, and I'm going to be with you. And he opens up and he says, I'm the God of your father, Abraham and Isaac. I'll be with you. I'll bless you. I'll keep you. I'll restore you to this place. And so what does Jacob do? Jacob does what Jacob always does. He, he's, he's trick, he makes a deal. He begins to bargain with God. He begins to work out a scheme. He says, okay, Lord, if you, let me sum it up. If you bless me and bless me and bless me and bless me and bless me, I will give you 10% and I'll tip my hat and let you be my God. Okay, Jacob, you're still trying to be in control. Jacob, you're still, now you're approaching. God approached you by grace and your response to him is to become a legal contract with him wherein you ultimately are staying in control. Jacob, this is not the way to respond to God's grace. This is not respond. And he wakes up in the middle of the night. He says, God is in this place. He pours oil upon the rock. And he says, guess what? This rock is going to be God's house. And I'm sure God's in heaven going, yay. I mean, everything you see in the Bible isn't necessarily a statement that it's true or good. You have to know God in order to know what's right and what's wrong. And obviously, I don't think God's really impressed. And so he named it Bethel. Bethel. But previously, it was called Luz. I would suggest It still was Luz. It wasn't Bethel. It wasn't a house of God at all. And so what it tells us in chapter 29 is that God puts Jacob. Jacob begins to run away from his house. God meets him in the wilderness. And now he comes to the region where Laban dwelt. And apparently he gets this woman right off the bat. He said, do you know this Rachel? Do you know Laban? Yeah, we know him well. Everybody knows Laban. I mean, ugh. But yeah, we know. As a matter of fact, there's his daughter coming right now. His daughter comes down. And he begins to say, probably in his mind, thinking, wow, God's with me. He's blessing me. Must be on my journey because how could this happen unless God was with me? And he runs and he meets Laban. And Laban says, Jacob, you know, you've been serving me here for a month. You know, you've been living in my house. You can't serve me for nothing. Make me a deal. What are your wages? And he says, I will serve you seven years for your daughter, Rachel. And he says, deal, seven years. And what did we find? what we found was that God wanted to give him Rachel by grace. He wanted to graciously say, Jacob, stay in Canaan. I'll bring Rachel to you. You'll have 12 children by her, and I'll bless you. But what happens? He works for what God was going to give him. He's not entering in by grace. He's entering in by what he will do for God, not what God will do for him. And therefore, even if God did bless him, he'll think he deserved it. And Jacob, what are your wages? These are my wages. This is what I'll do for God to get what I know that he wants to give me. Isn't it interesting that Rachel is the one that couldn't bear children? And I truly believe, the scripture doesn't say this, but I truly believe because that deep love he had for her, she was the one he was to marry. And if he would have walked in grace, she would have been uh, having many children, living in a shoe along with Amber. (laughs) And so there they'd be, verdant, fruitful, but no. He is a trickster. He's tricking his father with his sight, with his, with his disguise. He's hiding himself and pretending to be someone else that he's not. So what does God do? He puts him in touch with Laban. And as soon as he says, I'll work for you for seven years for this woman, he works for her seven years, and it seemed only a few days because of his great love for her. He goes into the wedding night because in that day they wear a complete veil, not even the see-through ones like we see today, just totally blocked out her face. It says that Leah had sad eyes turned the other way. And it says that they went into the bedroom, they consummated the marriage, they fell asleep, they woke up in the morning, he turned over and, ah, it's Leah. It's not Rachel. It's not the one that I loved. And what just happened? He goes to Laban and he says, what did you do to me? He says, it's not custom in our land to give the younger daughter first. Listen, fulfill the marital week, stay with her for seven days, and then I'll give you Rachel after that, and then uh, you can work for me for seven more years. And he agreed. Because he loved Rachel. 
And so now he's working for 14 years laboring for something that God would have given him. Here he was, just gets done tricking his dad with costume. Now he gets snookered so much more than his, he ever tricked his dad. He gets tricked with the woman he loves. I mean, can you imagine this? Can you imagine falling in love with some gal and then waking up in the morning and seeing her you know, ugly stepsister sit next to you? Be like, oh, what has happened to me? And so God is beginning to judge him. God is beginning to work within his life to bring him under that judgment or that Dan, we could say, that judgment. He's bringing him to this point of having to come to wrestling with God where he can no longer deceive people and trick people and work the angles in order to get what it is that he wants. And so it tells us that now after working for 14 years, he begins to have children. And the chapter, there's many things that we read that we could talk about. We could talk about the tragedy of polygamy. Polygamy means that there's many wives. Uh, Gamus, gami, from the Greek, uh, meaning uh, marriage. Poly, meaning many, many marriages. And they're thinking, this is hell enough. You know, what, what is polygamy? I, I, I know the technical meaning of it, but I think the, the connotative meaning in Greek is hell on earth. I mean, marriage to multiple women? Not, one woman is good. Two women, not good. And these women are fighting. I had a man a few years ago, actually when we first came to Sandpoint here a few years ago, that was building a defense for me biblically that, uh, that justified polygamy. And he says that the scripture teaches it and it's a good thing. I said, all you got to do is read Genesis 30. It's not a good thing. And it says there was fighting and contentions and problems going on in the family because they chose more than one wife. God had said in his word, the standard is not what the Bible says in this sense. The standard is who God is. And if you don't understand this in the scripture, you're going to fall into all sorts of error. The truth is truth because it's who God is. If you only do things or don't do things because what the Bible says, then you're going to end up chopping up your concubine, kicking her outside, and sending her 12 pieces across the nation of Israel. I mean, the Bible says it. Yeah, but follow it up. Each man did what was right in his own eyes. In other words, there was wickedness. So when the Bible shows us things, Genesis chapter 38, Judah's going into a prostitute. I mean, if you could go, well, you know, Judah did it, I can do it. Not that I'd ever want to. Trust me. But I can imagine if I can go and some guy saying that. I'm thinking, oh my, you want to do that. And you're looking for justification for it. But so you don't know what the, but you don't do what you do because the Bible says it. You do what you do because God is it. God is the standard of what truth is. Jesus said, I am the truth. And you know God, you walk with him, and then you see, hey, I'm not supposed to chop up my wife into 12 pieces and send her off to the children of Israel. Hey, hey, because I know God, I'm not supposed to go into a prostitute. I mean, the Bible says it, but it was giving a bad example. How do you know it's a bad example? Because God's not like that. That's how I know. So when God gave the Ten Commandments, it wasn't the Ten Commandments just to try to, you know, try harder type of thing. The Ten Commandments is a revelation of the perfection of the character of God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But then Paul, John says in 1 John 3, sin is lawlessness. And if sin is falling short of the law, and Paul says in Romans 4 that sin is falling short of the glory of God, you have one logical conclusion. The law of God is equal to the glory of God. In other words, the law of God reveals the nature and the person and the character of who God is. Thou shalt not steal. Why? Because you were made in the image and the likeness of God, and God is not a thief. The law of God reveals the character of God. So you have to know who God is and what he's like in order to ju- learn. And so when you look at a passage like this, it's like, well, look, they, they got married to many wives. Let's try it and put it on a television show on A&E or something like this. No, it's a bad idea. I know our Mormon friends think that it's a good idea. I was uh, one of my interns in Spokane was the child, one of many, many ch- children of the second largest polygamous family in all of Utah and actually all of Mormonism. And all I could say is that it was torturous, it was evil, and it was very heartbreaking for this young man. It's not a good thing. God intended a man and a woman to invest themselves in the rearing of the one child. What do we see? Fighting, contentions, jealousy. And that's when Rachel finally sees that her sister is buried more children than her. She says, give me children or I die. It was what Matthew Henry said many a year ago. He said, here she is grieving. And you know what grieving is? Grieving is 
uh, grieving is uh, being or envious. That's that's what he said. He said it's envying, and he said envying is grieving at the good of another. What are you doing? She's envious. How do you know you're envious? You're grieving at the good of another person. Give me children or I die. He says, am I in the place of God? You're the one barren. But what's the problem? Jacob, you tried to put yourself in the place of God when you try to make your life work by using deception to bring it about. So even though you're rebuking your wife who is barren, hey, she's the one you loved. I would suggest to you again that if he would have waited, God would have brought her to him. If he would have stayed in Canaan and obeyed God and submitted to the weird dynamics going on in his family, God would have worked it out for the good, and he would have brought her to him if he stayed in the spirit, and she would have been the bearer of his 12 children. But because of his cleverness, God still brought about his 12 children. That's his sovereignty. And in fact, he made her barren. And so we could talk about these weird dynamics. We could talk about the weird things. But really, when you get down to it, it gives us a list of names of children that were born to Jacob. It tells us that the order of them is Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and then later on it tells us Benjamin. And so the chapter only speaks of 11 children being born, but ultimately there's 12. The last one is Benjamin. So what is being said here? I think I didn't know that people had looked at it this way before, and I found that certainly some people have looked at it this way as being a picture of the church. They say that there's a a description that's given in each of the names that gives a picture of God's working through the church, and I looked into it, and it doesn't quite fit. Uh, They talked about the whole history of Israel as being laid out here, and in fact, it works. The whole history of Israel is being laid out in these names of the different man. Uh, they get into the talking. I, don't, I didn't spend any time researching this in great detail, but they talk about Reuben and Simeon being the first two stages of the nation of Israel. And the first two stages of the nation of Israel, as their name suggests, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, the Lord has seen that I'm hated. And then Simeon means, uh, it talks about him, now this time my husband will be attached to me. And they say, look at this. They, Reuben means they, they saw the affliction. Simeon means they heard the affliction. And if you go to the book of Exodus and see the nation of Israel, God saw that the children of Israel being afflicted. He heard their cry coming up. And therefore, he joined them, Levi, to him. And when did he join them? At the Passover lamb. That is, he became husband. That's the place of the covenant, just like in the new covenant at the Passover. It's a picture of us eating with Christ and becoming one with him. The first thing he does when he comes back again at the second coming is we have a marriage supper of the lamb. We become an espouse to him. So the Passover, if you will, or communion is only like a promissory note of like a, an engagement ring, if you will, that I'm going to partake of this with you. I'm devoted to you, but one day I'm going to be fully there with you. But here Levi comes in and says, I'll be joined to him. And they go through the entire history, and believe it or not, it actually works, as I said. But taking it more strictly to the context, what I think is going on is that Jacob is being dealt with by God himself. Jacob is being rebuked and reproved over and again. You see, again, even as I said earlier on, that as Jacob had tricked his dad by clothing himself and pretending to be someone he was not, he allowed Laban to trick him by clothing someone so they could pretend something that they're not. And he began saying, Jacob, wake up. Jacob, I'm letting you reap what you sown so that you'll come to a point of repentance. And so it tells us that these children are born, but I don't think it's for no reason that their names that are given to them are very specific. Again, look what it says about Reuben. Leah bears a child. His name is Reuben. She says, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, is now, now my husband will love me. And so she, named, she conceived again, uh, she named him Reuben, excuse me. And Reuben means see, the Lord will see something. And then it says Simeon here. The Lord, he says, because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me also a son, and she has named him Simeon. And that means heard. So the first two is he has seen something. God has heard something. Something is heard as well as being seen. And then it says in the third thing is Levi. And Levi was born. And she says, this time uh, uh, my husband will be attached to me or joined to me. So Levi means joined. So we got something about sight, something about hearing, 
something about being joined. And then it says, fourthly, it says, Judah, this time I will praise the Lord. And she named him Judah because Judah means praise. So sight, hearing, being joined, praising, that is a time of rejoicing. But then immediately it's followed by Dan in verse chapter 30, verse 6. Dan means judgment. <laughs> Seeing, hearing, being joined, praising, and then being judged. Judgment. Dan means judgment. God has judged me and has also heard my voice and given me a son. Seeing, hearing, joining, praising, but then being judged. And then Naphtali, he tells us here in verse 8, with mighty wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister and prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali. Naphtali means wrestling. Seeing, hearing, being joined, praising, being judged, wrestling, and then Gad here in verse 11. Leah has another son, Gad. It means good fortune has come. So she called his name Gad. Good fortune has come. So I'm going to call you Gad. They think in the ESV that it means good fortune, and certainly there's that implication in it. I think the old version says, a troop cometh. A troop cometh. And that is a more accurate understanding. The troop has come. So again, keep in mind, seeing, hearing, being joined, praising, judging, wrestling, and a troop comes. And then he says they have another child, an eighth child. It's Asher. It means happy. Happy. Happy am I, for women have called me happy. So she called his name Asher. Happy. Then we have Issachar. Issachar seems a bit more cryptic. It says in verse 18, it says, Leah says, after she sells her sons out picking mandrakes, they believe that mandrakes were somehow, um, uh, and, you know, like a Viagra type of a thing. And so he goes out and says, look, I've picked my son's mandrakes. Hey, give them to me, you know. You've already stole my husband. And they fight back and forth. They say, look, you can have them tonight if you give them me after that. So she has them for one night and she conceives again. <laughs> so God has given me wages because I have gave my servant to my husband. And so she called his name Issachar. Issachar in verse 18. Issachar means wages or hire, if you will. And so you have seen, hearing, being joined, praising, judging, wrestling, the troop come, happy, wages, and then Zebulun means honor. It says there in verse 20, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will honor me because I've borne him six sons. And so she called his name Zebulun. The idea of Zebulun is honor, or, but it's like the idea of dwelling, a dwelling in honor. God has given me a, a, an honorable place to dwell. Honor, dwelling is the idea. And then Joseph being the last one in the chapter, it says in verse 23, God has taken away my reproach. So she called his name Joseph. May the Lord add to me another son. So it says, see, then hearing, then being joined, then praising, judging, wrestling, troops coming, happy, wages, honor, adding, and finally the last son is Benjamin, which we'll see in a moment. Now, those of you that understand Jacob's life, would you say that God was powerful in speaking to him or no? God was speaking to him loud and clear. You know, there's a sense that you hear about as much as you want to hear from God. You know what Jesus said? Blessed are those who casually approach the scripture and have no real desire for it. But, you know, maybe sort of if there's nothing better to eat, for they shall be filled. You know what Jesus said? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That is the character of God, for they shall be filled. There's very much a sense in the scripture that if you really want to know God, he'll be known. The scripture says in James, draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. And God is there to be known, he's there to be sought, and he's speaking. But why in the world do we need to draw near? Because God is speaking, but sin has separated us from him. And therefore, I have to change my mind about myself. That's what the New Testament calls repentance. I have to repent so I can tune in, if you will, to his radio station. 
But as long as I'm on my radio station and turning to the dials that I want, God's speaking, but I'm tuned into, you know, Rock 101 or something like this. I don't know. I'm making up a station. I don't know what it, but he's tuning, they're tuning into their own choice. So it's not until the man begins to say, I want to listen to God. I have a hunger for him that God will speak. Now, why would people not want to hear what God has to say? I mean, think it through. Do you really want to oh, pride? Sure. It's ultimately related to pride. Is I don't want to do what you want me to do. I want to do what I want to do. And of course, yes, that is absolutely pride. I don't want you, Lord. I want to do my own thing. I want to go where I want, when I want, how I want, where I want. And in fact, I don't trust you. I trust that you're trying to do me evil. I trust that you're going to make me have a terrible life. And if I truly follow you, then you're going to do something terrible that I'm going to end up having to have a terrible career. I'm going to become so. I'm going to become a dentist. Who wants to be a dentist? Sitting all day and having conversations with people, sticking your fingers down their throat and asking them deep questions that they can't answer. <laughs> Who wants to do that? Not me. And if I somehow, you know, you know, <laughs> you know, this breath coming out, warm breath of people, I oh, just, no, no, no. And if I somehow give myself to the Lord, then he's going to do that to me. And so I get scared. So whatever it is that Jacob believes and what's driving him behind it is a lack of faith. There's a lack of faith. There's pride. There's a lack of faith. I don't really believe God. And therefore, even though God is speaking to him over and over again, he's in fear and in pride listening to what he wants to listen to, but ultimately because he doesn't trust God at all. Okay, God, if you're really good to me, then I'll do this for you. And if you're good to me over here, I'll tip you over here. That's not the relationship of grace. That's the relationship of legislative works where you're in control. And so what God does is give him these sons that, yes, they portray the history of the nation of Israel because they are Israel. But I think more immediately as the word of God is a double-edged sword. There's multiple meanings, two edges on it. The meaning that's going on here is that God is actually dealing with the very particular sin of Jacob. I told you to stay in Canaan. I told you to be in that place. You got clever, broke up the family. You have to run out of the land, the land that I told you to stay in. Now you're there running around in places that you think that you're going to be clever. God's with me. Look, I found the girl so quickly and easily. And I'm going to let you meet her father or her brother. And he is going to be the biggest weasel, her father actually, the weasel. And he's going to work you over like you've never been worked over. You want to trick people with your clothes? I'll have him trick you like nothing you've ever seen. And he starts having children. And the first thing that God does in having Reuben is to remind him about sight. Sight. Is that, Isaac is there. I, I, I can't really see you, son. Is that really you, Esau? Yeah, that's really me. And the second thing he wants him to understand is hearing. Remember what your father heard? With sight and hearing, do you remember this? This was the point of your deception. You spoke things. What's your name? I'm Esau. I'm Esau. He wasn't Esau. He was Jacob. He was a heel catcher. He was a trickster. He's always tripping people up, but he's trying to be someone that he's not. He's pretending he's lying. What do you see? Your father couldn't see. You can't see. He's bringing to remembrance sight. And then the hearing of the thing. Hearing. The first thing that he does when he deceives through sight and hearing is he runs out of the land, and the first thing that happens is he finds a woman, Leah, he thought it was Rachel, to whom he got married, just like the Passover. He got married and he got joined to her. And in fact, the name of Levi is joined. Do you really want to hear what God's saying to you? Seek him with Half of your heart, partially some of the times, and he'll reveal himself to you. No. Seek him with all your heart, 100%. No, seek him with 99.4% of your heart, and he'll reveal. No. Seek him with all your heart. Well, I'm listening to, you know, 89.7. You know, and you know what 89.7 sounds like? <laughs> You mean in order to hear 89.9, I have to be 100% dialed in to it? Yes. 
If you will seek me with all your heart, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Do we want to know? There's enough information here. I'm telling you something. Your wives are naming these children, not you. And the order of their names should at least make you begin to think about sight, about hearing. Now here you are married to a woman that you were tricked with. You were joined to her originally, and Judah means praise. You were joined to this woman. You were happy. You were celebrating. And suddenly you realize in the middle of the night, it's Leah. And now, now begins the point of judgment within your life. Now's the point where God's going to begin to judge you. He's going to begin to work through you and to beat this thing out of you, your trickster. You think you're clever? I'm going to make a man way more clever than you. He makes a set of wages with you, as we read here tonight. He goes, why are you trying to leave me? Tell me my wages. I've served you for 14 years. He goes, look, I want to start my own family. I want to get out of here. He's like, look, I learned by divination that the Lord blessed me because you're here with me, so name your wages. And he goes, okay, six more years for all your sheep. And Jacob's going, ha, 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 I'm going to trick him. I'm going to take away all the speckled and spotted sheep. I imagine he hatched the plan of cutting stripes into sticks beforehand. I don't know, but something like this. But Laban, Laban tricks him. He pulls away all the speckled and spotted sheep before he could go through the flock. So when Jacob went out and w- looked at the flocks, he's like, there's no speckled or spotted in anything. He sent his, Laban sends his sons away with all the speckled and spotted sheep, way far away so nobody can check. And he's sitting there and he's gone, I've been schnookered again. I promise to, flock, to, to watch over the flocks of Laban, and I get all the spotted speckle and the black lambs. There's none in the entire flock. So he says, I'm going to get more clever. I'm going to cut little stripes and sticks and make them. I mean, because God knows that if I cut stripes and sticks, then that's going to make them happen. It doesn't make it happen. It's his own fantasy. It's his own ideas. He's working it out. So when the scripture tells us that God blessed him because of this, in this, it wasn't because of it. It was in it. What's the difference? When God blessed him, it was his grace. Jacob, I was going to give you anything. I was going to bless you in this. But you are always so clever that you have to work it out yourself. You have to get cunning and clever and work the angles and talk to this guy and talk to that gal and make this happen and be clever and work. and yeah. But God be God. And if he tells you to do something, do that. Nothing else. Let God be God. When he instructs you in some area, obey him. But I'm not here to keep him in business. He's here to keep me in business. He's the master chess player, and he tells me which part to move. But if the pawns on the, on the chess board begin to move themselves around, they're going to make a mess. They don't have the overall view. A pawn only has the picture of what's directly in front of him or directly diagonal to him. He doesn't have a view of the whole board. And God is the one who makes the decisions. So God is going to bring Jacob into a judgment. And for the next years upon years, he blesses him. He gives him lots of speckled and spotted flocks and everything else. He still blesses him, but he thinks that it's him. Finally, he ends up sneaking out in chapter 31. We'll see this in another study. He sneaks out in the middle of the night with all of the goods. He's going to steal away. Laban is pursuing him. God tells him, if you say anything good or bad to that man, I'm going to kill you. He approaches him, overtakes him. He makes a a covenant, an oath with him. He survives that. God protected him in it. But as he goes away from that confrontation with Laban, he goes and gets back down upon the ground. He's sleeping in the middle of the night. He hears that his brother Esau is coming with, with hundreds of troops towards him, with swords, not coming out to give him a great big kiss. He's going to destroy him. Finally, I got my chance 21 years later. I'm going to kill him. He wasn't coming out just on a little, you know, you know protocol mission, you know. Being, <laughs> I'm going to kill him. You don't bring 400 men with you otherwise on horses. And he lays there in the middle of the night. He's got Laban behind him. He's got his family split up. He's wrestling with God. He doesn't know what to do. And God literally comes to him in the middle of the night and starts wrestling him, forcing him, turning him. And you know what's the question that God asks him? He says, who are you, Jacob? Who are you? What do we understand by that? Are you still trying to pretend you're Esau? What's your name, he said. What's your name? Are you still trying to pretend you're Esau? You're still trying to pretend someone that you're not? And finally, when he confessed his sin, he said, I am Jacob. I'm a hill catcher. He said, at that point in time, 
God said, now I'm going to change your name. I'm going to change your name to Israel governed by God. And before he could ever confess the truth about himself, before you and I can confess the truth about ourselves, that's what it means to confess it, to see it the way God sees it. Homo legeo. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. When you see it the way God sees it, homo legeo, confess your sins at that point in time. What brought him to that point? His hip got knocked out of joint. I've never had that happen. I've had a shoulder knocked out of joint, and it hurt enough. It hurt more than snapping the shoulder joint completely in half. It was like, wow, that hurt. And I've done both. Popping it out of joint actually hurt worse. And as you're sitting there, you're going, oh, Lord, my hip is popped out of joint. And he was permanently crippled. In other words, it never went back in. And he's limping. But he finally confessed and he said, I'm a, I'm a trickster. I'm a trickster. So what happened in these names? Reuben, sight he's bringing to his remembrance. Simeon, heard what was in the trick, seeing and hearing. What immediately happened after that? He went and joined himself to a woman. And so he calls him Levi, meaning joined. He brings them together. He immediately praises because he's married. But that was actually the point of God's judgment, Dan. Dan is now this time of judgment. God is going to judge him and bring him into a whole series of trials where he's allowing Laban to touch him. Only so far, but touch him nonetheless. And it brings him to the point of Naphtali. And Naphtali means wrestling. He's wrestling with God upon the ground. He finally confesses his sin. He finally has a name change. When we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, he changes our name. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. And because of this, Gad is born. It says good fortune, yes, but actually more than that, because good fortune, yes, goes with happy, Asher. But look what it says again in the old version. The troop or the company is coming. In other words, what happened after he wrestled with the angel? His brother Esau came. The whole troop of them came. They were approaching. And Asher, here is this man who is broken. The enemy's coming against you. But when he finally here surrenders, there's that joy. There's the joy. And following the last category of his life, it says wages, honor, adding, and then finally the son of my right hand. Let me say this. These 12 boys all represent a rebuke, but also a struggle and a dealing of God, and finally, a death of a man. I didn't say that well. But the first four represent man's cunning. The second four represent God's dealing. And the last four represent man's departing. That is when man dies. And in man's cunning, we see Reuben, him reminding you of your sin, seen Simeon and heard Levi you trying to make life happen so you get your wife your woman you join yourself to her you're being happy because you're making it happen taking the bulls by the horn that's the first category of man that's true of all of us not just Jacob but then when God begins to deal with the man we come to the second category of four names he begins to judge us in the sense that he's allowing what we have done to come back upon ourselves. In other words, he's allowing us to reap what we have sown. When he brings us to that point of really wanting to surrender to him, I'm going to let you reap what you have sown. And it leads to a wrestling with God ultimately. Maybe 21 years later, 20 years later in Jacob's case, he's wrestling with God, but God finally knocks his hip out of joint. And this brings the good fortune and the happiness to his life. In the first stage of man, man is cunning. The second stage of man, God is dealing, where he's judging and wrestling with you. But the fruit of it is he brings good fortune and happiness, Asher. And the final stage of the man is when you and I are going to die. Because after this, he, of course, became an old man, He, of course, died many, many years later. But in the process of a man, we see this as three categories of the man. This is the final stage of the man, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. 
And Issachar tells us again, it says, God has given me wages because of my servant. I gave my servant to my husband. Issachar means wages or hire. Let me read to you a verse that tells us about the hire that we have received in Christ Jesus. Sometimes people think that when we come to the Lord, then we don't do anything. That's not true. We come to the Lord so that we can be his servants. And it tells us in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 24, it tells us, knowing that the Lord will, it says, what, do, what to do, verse 23, excuse me, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 2 Verse 6, Paul says something similar. He there says, He will render to each one, you and I, according to our works. And lastly, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the great passage about the coming of our Lord, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, he says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, there's many verses like this in the New Testament, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that the Lord, in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. And why do I see this as being the third category of man? Man starts off by being cunning. He encounters God. Now God is dealing. And now he comes to the time where he's finished his work. And in the finish of his work, the first thing that is said is Issachar wages. I could say man is getting his just reward. The whole summation of life upon the earth is retribution. Not retaliation on God's behalf, but retribution. We could say, you reap what you sow. And here we are getting wages from him, a reward from the Lord, as Paul said, a reward for faithfulness. Now here's this man that has worked heartily and steadfastly. He was now an old man. And the thing that God now gives him is wages. But with that is Zebulun. Zebulun is the next son. After God, I think of myself standing before the Lord, come now into the fullness of the blessing of the Lord. If I've been a faithful servant, Come now into the fullness of the Lord. That's my wages. That's the first point of coming before him when I die. But the second thing is here with Zebulun, honor or dwelling. God has endowed me with good endowment. Now my husband will honor me because I've borne him six sons. What's happening now? Here's the wages being paid for the very fruitfulness of life. And the sum effect is that I get honor or dwelling I think of Jesus in John chapter 14. In my father's house, there are many rooms. I think of the whole fact that God says there's many mansions. There's a dwelling places. That there's an inheritance. Paul speaks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That I have a tent not made with human hands, but made by God's hands. A home within the heavens. And there I find myself having a dwelling. The first thing is going to be my wages. My dwelling. And then it says with Joseph after this. God has taken away my reproach. I'll name him Joseph. May the Lord add to me another son. What happens in the final stage, if you will, after we stand before him and we die? God takes away our reproach completely. That's why people say, well, there's going to be no sin in heaven. Or there's not sin, but there's going to be no regret in heaven. There will be regret because he says, I'll wipe away every tear. And there's no wiping away of tears if there's no tears. But what God does in 1 Corinthians 3, he tells us that we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And the one thing that's going to be known about the judgment seat of Christ, if I could sum it all up, I said it'll be regret. Men are going to be there and say, I should have. I wish I would have. I didn't. And there's never a chance. It's not a judgment to go to heaven or to go to hell. It's rewards. It's wages. It's determining the depth of relationship for all of eternity. And I would say 1 Corinthians 3 is regret the judgment seat of Christ. But he says, at that point in time, God takes away my reproach and made the Lord add to me another son, adding. In other words, God has given abundantly beyond. And so the first stage of a man, man is cunning. Then God is dealing. And then when man has departed, man in departing is first given wages. He's given honor and dwelling. For those that have wrestled with God, and have come out broken, and have confessed their sins, and have had a name change, and prove, prove it by being ones who are happy and joyful in the Lord. Now for that man, he has wages, he has honor and dwelling, Zebulun, 
he is added to and the reproach is taken away in Joseph. But finally, Benjamin, and Benjamin simply means son of my right hand, son of my right hand. And why does he give the name Benjamin? What's interesting about Benjamin? What's the son of the right hand? I'll give you a verse in Revelation chapter 3. In Revelation chapter 3, the Lord talks about those people that overcome. Chapter 3, verse 21. And the Lord says, the one who conquers or the one who overcomes. Remember, he says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with him and he with me. And the one who conquers, the one who conquers the false system around them, the false presentation of God, who lives against it but for God. He says, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the, servant, what the Spirit says. Where did Jesus sit down? It tells us in Hebrews and other passages. He sat down at the right hand of the Father, the place of authority. What does it say for those who overcome? I will give you the right to sit with me on the right hand with me. You will dwell with me. What is the name Benjamin? It means the son of my right hand. What is the final realization, if you will, of this third working of a man? The third stage of the man? He receives Issachar, the wages, the honor, Zebulun. God takes away the reproach in Joseph. He adds to him, and finally he says, I'll give you the right to rule and to reign with me. You will sit on the throne with me if you overcome. Overcome what? That which is false. In the power of the Spirit, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. It's the Spirit of God speaking to you this, and therefore it's the power of the Spirit and I respond to it. And so what do we see here? I agree with many that this is one of the least interesting passages in all of Genesis. But then when you begin to look at it and see that there's actually a movement where God, through the names of these sons, is rebuking, reproving, and revealing to man what he ought to be, what he has done, what God is doing, bringing man to a point of wrestling, and finally surrender where there can be joy upon the earth. For that man, when he dies, there's wages, there's honor and dwelling. The reproach is taken away, and he's able to rule and to reign, Benjamin, with Christ. So, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to understand these things in the way that you called us to. We would not be clever like Jacob and go out and cut lines and sticks and say, this is somehow a way that we're going to get you working you would have given him those sheep and those goats, even if he didn't do that. But because he did it, he couldn't appreciate the grace that you were giving him. And therefore, he extended his trial, which was him thinking that he is the one that makes life happen. And so, Lord, we don't sit and contemplate our navel and do nothing. But neither do we run around and do everything. A servant simply only does what the master says to do. Nothing more, nothing less. Let us be servants. And when, if God has spoken to you and says, I want you to do this, just do it. If he hasn't said anything, wait upon the Lord and you'll renew your strength. But as servants of God, we only do what he says to do. It's not us cleverly trying to figure out our life, figuring out our spouse. We'll roll over. If you go out and run and get your spouse, you'll roll over and say, ooh, it's Leah. I thought I was marrying someone else. You weren't the person I thought I was marrying. But if you marry the one that God has given, you'll roll over and say, that's the one. Thank you, Lord. So I pray that you give us wisdom when we consider the life of this man. Spare us from his stupidity. Help us not to walk in pride. We pray for this grace in Jesus' name. Amen.